that, so my talk is about the Budapest Open Access Initiative. Now, that is now 10 years old. It was 10 on the 14th of February, very good date. And it was the original attempt to put into words what open access was all about and what we are meant to be striving towards. <laughs> Please stop that, Richard. <laughs> On the 14th and 15th of February this year, there was a meeting in Budapest of about 30 people representing various organisations that can influence the new developments in scholarly communication. And they met to discuss what has happened in 10 years, whether the original BOAI is still relevant, and we agreed that it definitely was and that we were meeting partly to reaffirm that. And then to look at the next 10 years and to have a think about what might be the best things to do and to come up with some recommendations on how to get where we think we ought to go. Mahatma Gandhi said this about fighting any battle where you have enemies determined to thwart you. First, they ignore you. This is the open access history altogether. They ignore you, then they laugh at you, and we went through that phase very definitely. Then they fight you, which we are probably still in, and then you win. And I think from Bill's introduction, we are beginning to realize that actually we are heading for that winning tape. A terrible thing to say in Olympics year. But anyway, there we are. So where have we come so far? Just a quick, this is very quick, because I want to get on to, the, to perhaps the more exciting things about where we think we're going next. So where have we come so far? Well, we started by, and I say we, I mean all of us, the whole community that's been working towards this fundamental and very important change in our scholarly communication system. We defined the concept of open access and why we wanted it. We described the issues that it encompasses and the implications for various constituencies along the way. We made the arguments that have to be made to try to persuade people that this is the right way to go. Started off by just making the arguments because there wasn't much evidence that it was a good way to go except, oh, that sounds like a good idea. But very quickly, evidence did become, did start to gather, or become apparent, and we started to gather it together. And using that evidence, we made the arguments again to different constituencies, different evidence, different information, different things have resonance for different constituencies. And that will continue to be the case for a long time yet. What works with David Willits will not work with a university vice chancellor and what works with the university vice chancellor would definitely not work with a researcher in his university. We have gathered evidence for the other beneficiaries that can enjoy good things from open access. At the beginning we were talking about the benefits for the research community, now we're talking about benefits for all sorts of other constituencies as well. Yes, the research community. Yes, the small business and innovative business community. Yes, the independent researchers. Yes, our teachers in our high schools. All these things and more can benefit from open access. Gradually, gradually, the hearts and minds are being won over. And policy development is showing that. And finally, open access has come into the mainstream. Bill went through a lot of things, Martin went through a lot of things, let me go through a lot of things too. But first of all, let me give you some of the evidence that, that PubMed Central gives us as to who can benefit from open access. There are two million full text articles in PubMed Central now, having been gathered over five, six, seven years, five since the proper mandate went on that, uh, that repository. It gets nearly half a million unique users per day. That is an enormous usage for academic material. 
A quarter of them come from universities. Who would have bet it would have been so low? But it is. So who are the others? Nearly 20% are what PubMed Central people classify as government and others. <laughs> it's a very nice little classification there, category. Government and others, they're, they're looking at domain names, of course, coming in. 40% from citizens. These are people coming in from domains that are not academic related and not .gov. So they're other people amongst whom are our independent researchers and people like me, of course. And 17% critical this, 17% from companies, businesses that need access to that material who cannot afford to buy it. So these are just some, this is just one little window snapshot of how open access is already benefiting communities and those data are rather nice to put in front of people that you're trying to per, um, persuade should develop a policy. We've also learnt about the economic effects of open access or of not having open access. And just very quickly, I don't want to spend too much time on this, the Hugo Project, the Human Genome Project, which ran for about 15 years, was financed by the US government and the US government put a lot of money into that project. It's generated, in return, a lot more money. The government put in $3.8 billion. It's generated economic activity worth nearly $800 billion. For every federal dollar invested, $141 worth of economic activity has gone on. And it's created over 300,000 jobs just in the US, these figures. They haven't looked at Europe yet or elsewhere. If we look at the other side of the coin and look at companies who do not have access to research material, this is our own study for the Danish government, we were able, by surveying these companies and asking them a lot of intrusive questions about their budgets and about how they are hampered by not having access to journals, we were able to show that these the problems in accessing material, finding and trying to access it, cost Danish small and medium-sized enterprises 73 million euros a year. That's quite a lot for an economy the size of Denmark's. It delays product development by an average of 2.2 years, which seemed to us at the time to be huge, but we went back and checked it and it was true and costs around 5 million euros per company. And these are little companies trying to get established and trying to innovate. Our economy is much like Denmark's in that it is based mainly on small and medium-sized enterprises and not on large businesses. Large businesses have big libraries and can afford to buy journals. But our economy is not is founded and is based mainly on the economic activity generated by these little companies. So we know very well that this kind of thing is happening here too. It's one of the reasons why Martin was talking about the innovation agenda. This has gone down very well, I think, in the corridors of Westminster. So, yes, and it's got become mainstream. Now, I haven't put this up so we can all gloat. Um, so, I have a straight face and I want to say that although The Guardian and certain other newspapers were occasionally covering something to do with open access, it was a very occasional thing up until last August when George Monbiot took a break from, from telling us all about saving the world with climate change and suddenly wrote this article. And it was a very strongly worded article, but then he never does pull his punches. And that started The Guardian, in particular, publishing regular articles about open access, written by all different people. So that's mainstream, if you like it. The New York Times, I've, this, this is the Wellcome Trust's um, new, stronger announcements that have been happening in the last couple of months. Covered, of course, over here, very 
much, but also picked up by the New York Times, again, suggesting mainstream journal, uh, journalism interest. A nice thing that happened about a month ago was that the all European academies, these are things like our Royal Society, the big science academies and arts academies in European countries have an organization where they all get together and they suddenly made their announcement about open science for the 21st century. Very significant because these people are very important and influential both in the world of research, but also in the world of politics across Europe. Governments listen to people like this. Brussels, the Commission. Oh, we say terrible things about the Commission, but it's on the right track now for Horizon 2020. Forget about the legislation about straight bananas and all that. They've got it on open access. And they are really are going to come up with something which is going to be better than where we are currently with the Commission. With a 20% mandate, we're going to get a 100% mandate. And they do fund, as you can see, a lot of research. It's covered not only by the Times Higher Ed there, but by science as well, that Horizon 2020 and 80 billion euro battlefield Science Insider also announced that the new Global Research Council had taken off. This is a kind of consortium of research councils around the world. They picked two things to focus on for the next period. One of them is open access. And there it is, expanding open access. Very good. Harvard then weighed in, just at the right moment, with its exhortation to its faculty about the cost of journals, that its library couldn't afford to buy them all anymore, and that the faculty should be using the Harvard repository to help things along with open access. That was a big voice speaking out again. And lest you think that all the bad press has been directed at Elsevier, most of it has, because Elsevier put itself in the front of the Research Works Act fiasco. But be assured that the other big publishers were right behind Elsevier, hiding, one might say, behind Elsevier, not taking the flack that Elsevier did, but nevertheless taking the flack elsewhere in the world because they're being shown up to be just as difficult, just as secretive, just as strong in their lobbying. This is something from uh, the common room. It's like the Australian equivalent of the Times Higher Ed. A little chatty bit in that called the common room. And this is, says, publishing old guard, not for changing. This is specifically about Wiley Blackwell, which is very strong in Australia in terms of lobbying. And it's a very sad day when I have to stand up and say people are strong in terms of lobbying. That's awful. Um, finally, just recently, Graham Taylor from the Publishers Association wrote this article in The Guardian attacking publishers will not make open access any more sustainable. The S word. Isn't that a bit rich, considering sustainability had never been on the publisher's agenda before, and suddenly, now we are moving towards open access, they want to start the argument about sustainability. Don't worry, we've got it sorted. That just seemed to fit the, huh, the uh, boat missing activity of Graham Taylor. So now we get to the BOAI. As I said, written in 2002 as a result of a small meeting in Budapest. Ten years later, we had a larger meeting in Budapest. Now, I'm, I make no apologies, really, for putting up slides with a lot of words on just for the next three slides. I want to take you through the nice words that were written in the BOAI. Poetic, almost, and certainly inspiring. They were written by Peter Suber, of course. Peter is now writing the recommendations from our meeting. I am not going to put the recommendations up one by one because they are not quite ready to be published. I will remind you that our meeting happened on the 14th and 15th of February. 
when you see the list of people who were at the meeting, any of you who follow the open access discussion list will not be surprised to know that the discussion has been going on amongst us all since then. And Peter, Will has, I think, pretty much got to forms of words that everybody is going to sign up to. If Peter were a British citizen, my letter to Downing Street recommending him for an honour for services to science would already have been delivered. <laughs> anyway, this is how it started, the BOAI. And then it went on to talk about the public good, which is to make, make things uh, accessible electronic distribution of research information, removing access barriers of all kinds and allowing uh, different kinds of use. That last sentence is lovely. I think uh, the sharing, share the learning of the rich with the poor and the poor with the rich, make this literature as useful as it can be and lay the foundation for uniting humanity in a common intellectual conversation and quest for knowledge. It's lovely, we couldn't think of any way to improve on that, so we didn't, it stays as it is. And then it defines open access, and I'll be walking through this a bit and relating bits of that to the recommend, some of the recommendations that are coming out. So it defines open access there, perfectly clearly, we know what open access is, the public good that they make possible is the worldwide electronic distribution of the peer-reviewed literature. So let me just say a word about that. Worldwide electronic distribution. The recommendations will say that all research institutions should have an open access repository. We are at an RSP meeting and we, as commonly happens, tend to get drifting off to talk about gold open access and APCs all the time, let us not forget that open access can be provided for nothing by putting work in a repository, be it an institutional one, be it a centralised one, or be it a, the catch-all one called the open depot for those independent researchers who do not have an affiliation which will accept their work. The recommendations will also say that research institutions and funders should have an open access policy, and it will say a lot more about the policy and, and the form that it should take, and that research funders should ensure that, a su that suitable arrangements are in place for their policy to be enacted. So, in other words, if they want work to go in a repository, if their policy is focused on green open access, they must make sure that they specify either in institutional repositories, if that's what they want, or provide their own centralised repository, if that is which, which they prefer. But not to leave people floundering. They need guidance on to what they should do. That phrase, the peer-reviewed literature, journal literature, that's what it said, peer-reviewed journal literature, and it's possibly the only thing that, there, that could be changed um, now. The, obviously, the recommendations will still cover the peer-reviewed journal content because that is the main target of open access. It will also mention theses and dissertations, and it will welcome other scholarly matter. So Martin mentioned the grey literature. It's welcome but it's not the main focus of open access. Here we go. Completely free and unrestricted access to it by all scientists, scholars, teachers, students, and other curious minds. Anyone who is interested in research findings should have free and unimpeded access to that. So completely free access for all is what the recommendations will continue to recommend for all. Not gifts from specific publishers for specific poor countries that get it for free until they, their GDP rises enough and then they have to pay for it. That is not open access. It is not national licenses that benefit only one population, one country, and where we have to go to a public library to look at this material. 
SMEs that wish to text mine the chemistry literature or the biomedical literature cannot do that by going to their public library, even if it's still open. Don't forget what we're trying to do is share the learning of the rich with the poor and the poor with the rich. And by that, laying the foundation for uniting humanity. Stick to the definition of open access. We can have extended access, we can have increased access, if we like, by these other mechanisms. But let's not call it open access and let's not let our policymakers be misguided into thinking that that's open access. It isn't. The BOAI also said to read, download, copy, distribute, print, search or link to the full text of these articles. We're talking here about reading, discussing, building and citing. I haven't come to reuse in any other way yet. I'm coming to that in a minute. So in other words, we say goodbye to the days of fair use and fair dealing restrictions and all those permissions that come with all that stuff. We say goodbye, hopefully, to lawsuits for, res uh, for researchers who pinch bit out, bits out of articles like graphs, put them on their blog and invite others to discuss them. There was one, it was withdrawn after a lot of hoo-ha. You can find out which publisher it was, it was shameful. Hopefully there will be no more of those in an open access world. But there will be, and the BOAI did say this, proper continuation of the proper scholarly practice of accreditation. So wherever you know the author, you should know the author, if you are going to take their material and reuse it, they should be cited. Now we get to the proper, what I call the proper, the, the, the challenging issue of reuse. Crawl these papers for indexing, pass them as data to software, or use them for any other lawful purpose. This is where we're coming to the new technologies that Martin referred to, text mining, and data mining. I'm talking to a repository audience, so you do know all about these, but I've, I've specifically um, split these away from the issue of just being able to read the article from a repository or in a journal. This is fundamentally different and requires licensing. The recommendations will cover licensing. Um, we discuss the fact that open access journals can always use an open license. They can always do that and should do. CC BY is preferred and it, that will be recommended as the kind of default license. Some journals, some publishers will not wish to use that license. We can't force them. If they want to put an NC on the end there and have a non-commercial clause as well. If they think it's necessary, okay. It's still technically open access. The recommendations will also mention, and this will be of interest to this particular audience, that green open access content in repositories should ideally carry an open license too. Now I know some repositories have worked a long way towards that, some haven't, and many, or probably most authors, to date, do not understand the significance and the implications of licensing their work properly when they put it in a repository. There's a lot of work ahead of us to try to, to educate, if that doesn't sound too condescending, educate the author community about this and the importance of putting the right license on which will allow proper use of their material in the future by these new technologies. For the moment, however, we will recognise in the recommendations that pragmatism rules. So in other words, I think the wording will be something like gratis open access, that is, being able to just read it, is better than no open access. That Libra open access, that is, with having the right licensing on top, is better 
than gratis open access. And where we can get more, we will get more, or we will encourage the getting of more. But it will take a lot of arguing, we realise that, to get to the point where all open access material is carrying the right licensing. With respect to the text mining issues that this licensing refers to, I just want to say a few words because there's been a lot of discussion lately by the open science community about this issue. Arguing, uh, well, debating with one another, let me say, um, about what they want. There's been some movement by the publishers, the big publishers. There's been some interesting cases uh, reported of researchers persuading publishers to give them certain permissions and so forth. So let's, let's just go through this so that we do understand where we think we're going with this. The vision is to have a fully open literature, mineable without any barriers, so no horrible, horrible restrictions on it. That's where we hope we're going. Repository content, as I've said, is rarely correctly licensed. It is in some cases, but that's quite rare. And metadata, as Balvia said, there's a lot of work going on in this area, but at the moment, metadata are usually not adequate for the guys who are doing this text mining to send their robots out. To f what they're looking for are papers that carry machine-readable open licenses. And then they know that they can take the content of those papers, harvest it, read, read through it, pick out the facts, pick out whatever they want there, and you reuse those things in conjunction with the same kind of stuff pulled out of other papers. Unless they can recognize these computer tools, unless they can recognize that a paper is properly open access, then they can't be allowed to mine that paper. And at the moment, such a tiny minority of papers are carrying the right licenses that we have only a tiny minority of the tiny uh, amount of the proportion of the literature available for text mining. It would help if the metadata can be developed so that these text mining tools have a kind of a lexicon, a vocabulary, and they're, they're looking for things, uh, a thesaurus, they're looking for different things, including that machine-readable license, and then in they go and take, take that. We heard from Belvia, it's a really interesting piece of work that JISC are funding there, quite extensive and very, very important. Open access journals, as I said, often do not carry the right license, though I think many of them are now moving in the right direction. They certainly can't be part of the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association, publishers who will not uh, put the right license on their open access journals. Hybrid journals very rarely license their content correctly at all. Um, and about 80% of the literature, of course, is still behind toll barriers. So we do have a problem with text mining at the moment. And it's, it's frustrating for the people who have developed these tools because they know the promise is huge, and yet they don't have the raw material, the material to work on. Um, and the final point is that even when journals are subscribed to by a library, a university library, the researchers within that institution do not have the right from the publisher to use their text mining tools on the content of those journals. They've paid for access to the content but they do not have the rights to mine it. Some publishers, oh, there, were, there is a researcher in the University of British Columbia, I think, who has done a deal to show it can be done with, is it Elsevier, Richard? It's Elsevier. So that she can mine the texts of Elsevier journals. And... Other big publishers have kind of said, in fact explicitly in the case of Bob Campbell of Wiley Blackwell, Wiley Blackwell, have explicitly said, this is okay, all researchers have to do is come and ask. Now, that is not a model that is going to work. There will be tens of thousands of researchers around the world wanting to use text mining tools 
There are a lot of publishers and a lot of journals, and I don't think the publishers are going to want letters, emails, from all these researchers asking for permission and having to set up gigantic permissions departments, which would tower over the size of their current permissions departments just to satisfy this need. It's an infeasible solution. And this is going to have to be changed. The recommendations from the BOI thing will have words to say about this. Obviously, nobody can be forced to do anything, but the recommendations will set this in the context of where we would like to go, that vision, and try to explain why this is such an important issue. It will also deal, the BOAI, with the prestige, and I, so I'm going off the text now and into other things that it's going to deal with, prestige and esteem. There will be explicit recommendations on new and alternative metrics, bearing in mind that what is inhibiting, really, the culture change that we need in researchers so far has been the fact that they are still assessed on the basis of outdated metrics, in fact, the journal impact factor. So the recommendations will be encouraging institutions and funders to use these new metrics in their evaluations of researchers. Now, we've seen some movement on this from HEFKE, which is very encouraging, and we've seen it practically introduced by publishers like PLOS, who are putting lots of article-level metrics on their articles. How many downloads has this had? Where have they come from? That kind of thing. How many citations and so forth? These are the metrics that apply to individual researchers. A journal impact factor does not and never has done. And so there will be a recommendation to the people that matter, the institutions and funders, to kind of move along a bit now and stop, stop thwarting progress by, by making people focus still on the fact that they have to publish in journals that have high impact factors. It's nonsense. Infrastructure, there will be some recommendations on this. One will be about interoperability. Ha uh, uh, amongst other things, it will say that repositories should be able to harvest and redeposit content. This is because researchers may be, and increasingly are, being asked to put their work in different places, more than one. And therefore, it will be very helpful if repositories, they put it in their institutional one, that the institutional repository can just send it to Pub, UK PubMed Central or whatever. So that's one thing. And the technology is there, really. It's just the will to get organised. Um, repositories should exploit all the opportunities they find to provide usage and bibliographic data and make these openly available, moving towards a completely open access corpus, particularly with bibliographic data. So new metrics, um, making things open that weren't pr previously open, and, th and that they should play their part in the, maybe even the development, but certainly in the adoption of alternative metrics. You have a major role to play, the repository community, in this. You can change the culture. And, and so this, the recommendations will call for that. So beware. Uh, more infrastructural things. It will mention an open bibliography, because we would like that at the moment. If you want a bibliography that covers most of the literature, you have to pay for it, as we know from Thompson or from Elsevier, open directories, such as we have at the moment, directory of open access journals, repositories, and so forth. We want more, and they may come. Bill said we don't know what we're going to be wanting in 10 years' time. That's true. Let's keep our eye on the ball and develop the things that are needed as they're needed to hope, help things along. And any other open tools for supporting this new scholarly communication world that we have. All sorts of things. These, I think, will specifically be mentioned in the recommendations, but, but others may be too by the, time, by the time agreement is fully reached. And they will, the recommendations will encourage, so back to the peer review thing, encourage new forms of peer review. We know there's a lot of contentious issues around that. 
but nevertheless, we think they're lovely. N and new forms, experimentation with new forms of the research article. Frankly, I think in 10 years' time, Bill, I, my bet is it won't look anything like it does now. Um, and I think this is probably the final point, advocacy. It will say something about advocacy because it is so important. The education of all stakeholders must go on to do with policy development, to do with culture change, and to do with battling against the FUD put out by certain, certain uh, parties, let's say. It will, we would like the advocates to articulate what best practices are, publish those to the community to help other people take them up, and to continue to gather evidence on all the things that we need evidence on, the benefits, the harm from lack of access, and on this issue of sustainability. And to recruit allies, not only the allies that we've always been recruiting, people like university managers and funders, but allies outside that research community in those other constituencies that I've mentioned before, particularly the business community. Yes, sustainability, that's right, this is where it ends. It will call for a coordinated approach to ensuring that critical services supporting open access are maintained. And that means the whole community looking at the business models that do work and playing their role in helping to support these things. Already we have some OA supporting services like DOAJ that has gone to the community for funding to support it. There may, that may be the way a sustainable business model for that kind of, of service, a directory service. But there will be other business models and they need to be explored, described and then supported by the community. The solutions will have to be consensual. We, we realise that. Martin said there is no more money and they're not going to be for another 10 years. We can't keep running to Hefke and so forth and say we need more money for this. It won't come. So there has to be a consensus amongst the community as to how that money that is already there and we know it's enough with plenty to spare. We know that from the economic modelling studies how that money is moved around and shared out to support what we think we need for this new scholarly communication system. Getting to a consensus will necessarily mean talking about roles and responsibilities and who takes the responsibilities on for certain things. So lots of discussion to come there. But, and, and let me just go back to that because Richard is always asking me about I'm sorry to keep pointing to Richard. But he's always asking me about whether there should be a, some kind of organising principle in the middle of the open access community that does this. And I keep saying to him, no. Uh, I still think I feel that. But I do think that to get the kind of coordination that we need, and that's coordination between a lot of rather disparate players, funders, research institutions, the individuals themselves, the people outside the research community, there is going to have to be more effort put into that kind of coordination activity than we've had to date. I don't know how it's going to go, and I'm certainly not going to stand here and make suggestions, but I do acknowledge that Richard has a point. And with that, I am going to finish. Thank you very much. <laughs>